It's looking very sunny where you are, Leslie. Yes, yes. Not Barbados, unfortunately. <laughs> But well, that's, that's downtown High Wycombe. Yeah, that's going to be next year, I'm afraid, isn't it? But um, you know, if 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 things change with this vaccine, it could all change very very quickly. Graham, we're live now. Mm. Members, we're now live. Welcome to the November meeting of the Executive Committee of Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes Fire Authority. I would like to start by confirming that this meeting is being live streamed on the Buckinghamshire Fire and Rescue Service YouTube channel. Following the meeting, a recording will continue to be available on this channel, and it is also being recorded should there be any technical difficulties. I'd just like to remind members of four key points, including a change in procedure from previous meetings. Firstly, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera when not speaking. Secondly, feel free to turn off incoming video, as this may help if you have a weak connection. Thirdly, if you wish to speak during the meeting, please turn on your camera to indicate a wish to ask a question or make a comment. The chairman will be notified of all members who have switched on their videos on. When the camera does invite you to speak, please unmute. Finally, when voting, members will be asked only to indicate if they wish to vote against or to abstain from a vote. Where this is the case, the chairman will ask you to switch on your camera to indicate that you wish to do so. These will be monitored and brought to the chairman's attention. If you do not switch on your video, this will be taken as silent assent. Before I hand over to the chairman, for benefit of the viewers of the webcast, Katie Nellist, the Democratic Services Officer, will read the list of members in surname alphabetical order. Please turn on your camera and unmute to respond when your name is called. Councillor Clark. Present. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Present. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Present. Thank you. Councillor Marland. I don't think he's joined us yet. Um, Councillor McCall. I'm here, didn't expect you to get to me so quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor McLean. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Walsh. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any apologies? Councillor Lambert. Thank you. We will now turn to the minutes. It's item two. Um, do I have your approval to sign the minutes as correct record of the meeting of the 16th of September? Chairman, no, it, Chairman, no member has indicated a wish to vote against or abstain. The, the recommendation is carried. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We'll now go to agenda item three, which is disclosure of interest. Are there any disclosure of interest? None declared, Chairman. Thank you. Have we received any questions? Uh, none received, Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll go now to agenda item five, and Laura Taylor will present this. And before she presents it, um, Councillor Hopkins, do you have anything you wish to add to um, it before Laura takes over? I don't think so, Chair. It's, it's a matter of report and it's very straightforward. So let's see what Laura has to say. Thank you. Laura, all over to you. Thank you very much. I am presenting the budget monitoring report as at the end of September 2020. Table 1 on page 15, Appendix A provides an overview of each directorate's budget and forecast outturn. The current expenditure forecast 31.901 million against a budget of 31.339 million results in an overspend of 562,000. However, due to the additional funding of 836,000 received in year in relation to COVID and protection grants, we are seeing a net overall underspend of 274,000. 
Moving on to page 16, this provides a summary of variances being seen within each directorate. Corporate core is showing a £3,000 underspend, which is relating to underspends in legal costs and consultations with public, as well as courses and conference fees postponed due to COVID offset, due to COVID, offset by unachievable interest income on investments and additional audit fees not budgeted for. Finance and assets is showing an overspend of 97,000, which predominantly relates to West Ashland revenue costs, which will be expected to be partially covered by charges to SCAS and TVP, not currently reflected in forecast. This is offset by underspends relating to vacant posts within the directorate that have been now filled or recruitment delayed due to COVID. Most of the underspend shown within people and organizational development are due to underspend seen within employee costs. In addition to that, we're not expecting £13,000 Thames Valley collaboration costs during the current financial year. Delivery, corporate development and planning is currently projecting £30,000 overspend. This is predominantly due to COVID response costs of 476000 which are reported within this directorate. In addition to that, 230,000 has been transferred to COVID-19 reserve as approved by the executive committee in September. This is offset by underspend seen within whole time and on call direct employee costs. And that's due to a number of whole time posts not at the top of pay scales and employees being on 2015 pension schemes, which would see a lower contribution rate than the budgeted 1992 schemes. Statutory accounting and, and contingency overspend of 500,000 relates to additional revenue contributions to capital as approved by executive committee in September. Moving on to page 17, table two, and this shows the breakdown of favorable and adverse variances relating to direct employee subjectives. Higher underspends are shown under on call relating to activity and training costs and underspend seen within support staff are due to delays in recruitment caused by COVID. Moving on to page um, 18, table three. This table shows the spend in relation to the COVID pandemic and how we are utilizing the COVID funding of 606,000 allocated in 2020-21. Funding table four. Um, on page 19 shows this additional 835,000 uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, funding for the current financial year. 606,000 relates to COVID and 230,000 um, relates to protection. Finally, moving on to capital, which is table five on page 20. Um, most of the capital works have related to the West Ashland, which is now in occupation by the fire service. As per the note in the report, the forecasted year-end variance for property review, 2.686 million, is expected to be offset by additional capital receipts and contributions, which will result in a net variance of around 1 million against the forecast expenditure. And that's it from me today. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much indeed, Laura. Very succinct and to the point. Um, does any member have a question? No. And we then go to the recommendation, which is on page, um, sorry. Oh. I think the recommendation is to note the report. Um, uh, so, that's correct, yeah. on, on page 13, that the latest projected outturn forecast for the authority as at 30th of September 2020 be noted. Are we all in favour of that, members? Chairman, Obviously. no member has indicated a wish to vote against or to abstain the recommendation. The recommendation is carried. Thank you. We now go on to agenda item six, which is on page 23. Um, again, it's Councillor Hopkins um, as the lead member and Asif Hussain will take us through it. Do you have anything to say on this, Councillor Hopkins? Nothing to say, although I will give you early notice, Chair, that I will have a question um, when ASIF has, um, sorry, when the when the um, presentation has been uh, completed. Thank you. So, um, ASIF, would you like to take us through this report, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, members. I'm presenting today in front of you the capital strategy 
The CIFA Prudential Code for Capital Finance in local authorities includes a new requirement for local authorities to produce a capital strategy which demonstrates that capital expenditure and investment decisions are taken in line with the services objectives and takes into account of stewardship, value for money, prudence, sustainability and affordability. The strategy outlines the authority's approach to capital investment, ensuring it is in line with its corporate priorities and objectives set out in the public safety plan. It provides a strategic overview of how capital expenditure and capital financing and treasury management activity contribute to the delivery of outcomes, as well as an overview of the management of risk and future sustainability. I must stress that the strategy is key in order for us to prioritise our capital programme. The reason being that we no longer receive any dedicated funding for capital. Since 2013-14, we no longer have received any capital funding. We used to receive in the region of around £1 million. Um, since then, it's all been funded from uh, revenue contributions to capital. This inevitably, inevitably puts pressure on our revenue budgets every year, and therefore it's vital that we do prioritise all our capital programme uh, in order of priority and mo most needed. I don't have anything further to add in terms of the capital strategy itself. Obviously, it plainly kind of sets out what our processes are in terms of how we go about setting the capital program, how the capital program is approved annually, uh, and therefore um, waiting any questions if there are any in relation to the capital strategy. Thank you very much indeed, Asif. Um, Councillor Hopkins, you have a question. I do, and, and thank you for that very brief and succinct introduction, Asif. Can I just ask, under 14.1 in the strategy around credit risk, um, you talk about due diligence um, before contracts are awarded, and I'd expect nothing less. But can I just ask, how do we monitor the risk of current suppliers becoming insolvent? I mean, we live in very challenging times. Uh, especially given the issues that many of them must be facing now as a result of COVID. And I wonder just how how robust um, that monitoring is and what safeguards there might be. Thank you, Camus Hopkins. That's a really good question. Um, in terms of how we monitor our suppliers at the moment, we currently have access to Experian Business Services. This allows us to have a, a live monitoring tool to be able to access any critical changes to us, critical supplies. Obviously, with the current pandemic going on, it's even more critical that we have an understanding of the financial stability of our supplies in order to be able to meet our demand. So we're regularly checking, checking our supply chains in order to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Moreover, our procurement team also have access to um, the credit ratings uh, for different supplies. So before we go out to procure any contract or any um, large value capital scheme, we will be looking to utilise this information in order for us to make an informed decision. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Hopkins? No, I am reassured, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McLean. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Asif, for the reports and uh, running the strip. In section 11.2, which is on page 34 of the, the pack or page 8 of the report, it uh, states at the present time the authority is projecting to receive 136,000 of section 106 funding. Where, Which authority or authorities is providing that and for, for what reason? And I, I'm, I'm intrigued by it for what the reasons. I don't think in Milton Keynes we've ever done that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Um, my understanding is that funding is being re received by Milton Keynes Council in relation to the Blue Light Hub. Um, in terms of any um, kind of upgrades we've done with, with the Blue Light Hub, so my understanding is Milton Keynes Council. Um, to date, we've only actually received 4K. We're still expecting to receive the 132K this financial year. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I should have looked back, but I didn't. I don't recall it. The City on Development Control, but I. I, I accept you're correct and I'll if you need any help about getting the 132k ask ask the lead member for finance um thank you I must also add sorry Councillor McLean I am aware that you've uh, highlighted a slight typo in one on one of the pages which we will correct before we forward on to the fire authority for approval that's fine thank you Asif would you like to drop your hand now Councillor McLean please 
Thank you. There are no more questions. Mr. Britton, will you read the recommendation, please, um, for Agenda Item yeah. 6? Certainly, Chairman. These are both recommendations up to the full authority. Um, the first, that the capital strategy is recommended to the authority for approval. And secondly, the recommendation that the authority add in its terms of reference determining the capital strategy as set out in Appendix C. And that's the terms of reference for the full authority. And as, as alluded to in the report, uh, that's Thank a you. function reserved to the full authority. Thank you. There's nobody abstaining or against. Nope. Um, Chairman, take that recommendation. Yep. No yeah. member has Thank indicated you. a wish to vote against or abstain the recommendation. The recommendation is carried. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Britton. We go now to agenda item seven, which is on page 49 of the pack. And um, I do have to say this is Councillor Hopkins sort of, you know, show. Do you have anything to add before we ask um, Mark Hemmings to take us through this report? Uh, no, I don't, other than to say I will have a couple of questions on this one, just to give you early notification that when the presentation is completed, I'd like to come back in, please. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, Mark, it's over to you, I think. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, good morning, members. So, today I'm presenting the Financial Strategy, which is a new document designed to take a longer-term view of our finances, and it will help guide future medium-term financial plans and annual budgets. As with any good strategy, it looks at where we are now, where we'd like to be, and how we plan to get there. It draws info from a number of sources, including HMIC FRS reports, internal and external audit reports, financial analysis, and also the self-assessment we've carried out, which is in Appendix, Appendix A to Annex 1. One of the key elements of this strategy is a consideration of the potential scenarios that we may face especially in relation to COVID and potential funding uh, reductions. This is shown on page 76 of your PACs, page 24 of the strategy. And I'll just briefly talk you through how we've come to those scenarios. So one of the scenarios is the no change scenario, which is kind of our base point, And that's where we kind of would be if nothing changed from last year's MTFP. So we've looked then, um, we've got indications around COVID and potential reductions in council tax and business rates as a result of people moving on to council tax support and also potentially businesses closing uh, due to financial pressures. And we've taken a pessimistic view that we could be as much as a kind of 1.7 million shortfall in this scenario. We then looked at a possible reasonable worst case scenario, which is in addition to that, if we were to lose some specific funding around new dimensions, filing, et cetera, and also the pensions grant. And then on the flip side of that, we've also looked at a possible optimistic scenario. And this if, was the authority to achieve additional precept flexibility. So for example, if we could increase council tax by five pounds rather than the 2% current limit, it would give us additional funding and how we'd look to use that if that was forthcoming. So against each scenario, I've highlighted some possible actions and these are informed if you turn to the previous page, page 23 of the strategy or 75 of your PACs. This shows the consultation we undertook when producing the current public safety plan. And we asked members of the public um, kind of how they would deal if it was up to them with any financial pressures that we may face. Uh, top of that was to increase the council tax to protect services. And then if that wasn't an option, uh, possibilities around reducing immediately available fire appliances or consolidating or closing fire stations if the worst case did come to the worst. Also within this document, there's the reserve strategy, which is on page 81 of your PACs or 29 of the strategy. Um, members should note this is based on the no change scenario. So as it was at the last MTFP, where our reserves balances will be headed on that basis. Um, so it is subject to possible change. I think the key point to note from the reserve strategy is that potentially we've got around 1.75 million pounds of earmarked reserves that could be repurposed should we have a funding reduction and we need to mitigate the impacts of that over the short term whilst we consider longer term solutions um, to meet the challenge going forwards. Um, the strategy is then rounded up into an action plan which is on page 72 of your PACs um, or page 20 of the strategy. 
So this sets out what we plan to do over the next five years to address some of the challenges identified and covers things such as a review of systems, a value for money review, establishing the PMO and a review of our performance reporting arrangements. Um, as noted by ASIF in the capital strategy, Councillor McLean's also picked up a couple of typographical errors in this report, which we will correct before it's presented to the fire authority. Uh, but in summary, this strategy is a document which addresses some of the concerns raised by HMIC, uh, namely to ensure that the authority has the capacity and capability to support its activity in the public safety plan, and that we use sound financial management to ensure all potential additional costs and liabilities are accounted for, and that there's a contingency plan in place for these eventualities. I'm happy to take any questions that members may have. I know uh, Councillor Hopkins has a question and I also will have a question. So, Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mark. Can I say an excellent report, despite um, the couple of typos, it really is excellent and, and easy to read. And I think we're very lucky to, to have you as uh, managing this particular team. Can I ask a couple of questions? This is relating to the action plan, which I think is page 20 isn't it, of the report, page 72 yeah. of the agenda. Uh, in the current year, what does the, um, the review of value for money by the external provider actually involve? Now, my second question, in 2021-22, I thought I could observe um, that the review of the budget monitoring and performance arrangements cover a large number of sections within the self-assessment, which I think is Annex 1. Yeah. Uh, so can I ask for your initial thoughts on how you see that developing, please? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, certainly, Councillor. If I may, I'll take the second question first and then bring Asif in, because Asif has been more involved in detail in the value for money survey. So in terms of the question relating to the budget monitoring and performance reporting, I think one of the things that we notice when doing the self-assessment is that we've got very good budget monitoring reporting. As Laura presented earlier, very comprehensive report. We also have other statistics and performance monitoring around operational standards like attendance, time, availability, etc. Um, I don't think on any regular basis we bring them together. We have the balanced scorecard, which we present annually, but I think there's probably some development we can do to bring the financial and the performance data together. So it's kind of, it's very good saying we've got an underspend, but it's then the reason for the underspend of the impact that's having. So one of the reasons we've got an underspend is because of on-call staff, slightly under establishment. What impact does that have on on-call availability and attendance times, for example? So I think we've got very good reports as it is. It's just trying to bring those together to give a better overall picture of where we are as an authority. Um, so and I'll bring Asif in on the first point around value for money because that's been something he's been leading on predominantly. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of value for money, um, currently we're working with an organisation called Proven. Um, Proven are an organisation that have worked with Surrey Fire Service in order to develop a benchmarking toolkit for the fire sector specifically. So until now, if I'm being honest, most of our value for money has kind of been more of an internal exercise and using SIP for stats, which, have, which are probably not fit for purpose and don't have the relevant indicators that we want to compare against. So what we've been doing with proving is we've got together several fire services and to date there are nine services that have opted in to this toolkit and to producing a more comprehensive toolkit. Um, we're working with them to identify these kind of benchmarks that we want to highlight and compare against and are fit for, for purpose for us. It's like I said, it's not something that's probably happened overnight, it's something that we've kind of been working on sort of 12 months. In terms of what our plans are going forward, we're looking to bring in proving sort of early next year, sort of around January, to kind of look at the model in a lot more detail, ensure that we have consistent benchmarks across the fire sector and we agree with them and more so also have more relevant ones for us as well. So that's what we're looking to do. Um, I think this is a really good tool, something that will allow us to kind of compare against other fire services or similar fire services uh, within the region. And moreover, it'll give us something that we can use annually as well to be able to carry out a more comprehensive review. I'm also aware that Proven have discussed this model with our inspectorate as well. And are also trying to get in contact with SIPFA as well to, to kind of get their feedback and get their buy-in towards this model as well, which can only be beneficial. And I think it's, it's going to be a really useful and vital model going forward. 
I think in the end, the end result will be we'll probably produce, we will be producing a report on it, on how we've performed, and the likelihood is that we'll probably be presenting that through our ONA board uh, and comparing our performance against our colleagues in the fire sector. Thank you very much indeed, Asif. Yeah, I, I think the, the use of the use of proving is really a step in the right direction, Asif. So uh, well done for that, mm. and thank you, Mark, for your first answer. You're welcome, Councillor. Councillor McLean, you've got a question. Thank you, Chair. It's in relation to Annex One, page thirty-three or eighty-five. Uh, it's the insurance successes are set at five thousand pounds, and we're providing for a max or assuming ten claims over five thousand pounds in any one year. Uh, so is that been based on the say the last five years experience that that's the average number of claims or have we uh, have we had a peaks and troughs which is not getting indication where did he come from mark okay um yeah that's based on kind of a worst case so when we put that in place we looked back i think five or six years and i think in the worst year we had kind of about nine kind of vehicle incidents um and they weren't anywhere near that amount, but it's kind of that's the worst we might have. And if they were all over that amount, then that's an amount we set aside. So it's it's probably slightly overly prudent. But I'd rather have slightly too much put aside than not enough in terms of insurance access. That's that's fine. I I would agree with that. It can always be rolled forward and repurposed if necessary. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank thank you. you. Right, I've got a couple of questions. Um, on page twenty. Um, of the pack or in Annex 1. Um, 2425, you've got here zero base budget in preparation for public safety plans to reset any budgets that may have drifted over time. I was under the impression that we were already doing zero base budgeting and therefore should there be any drifting over time? So it just seems strange that you're looking to make sure there's no drifting when we're doing zero base budgeting. Yeah, so we did the zero base budget last year in preparation for this year. So it was a big exercise, essentially stripping everything back and then building it up again. Um, it's not something we do every single year because of the amount of work involved. So this year we've gone back to the incremental approach where we've assumed actually because we did the zero base last year, it's broadly correct. We have challenged a few areas um, because, because we've reset the base, it's given us opportunity to challenge better. Um, so it's probably something we'd look to do perhaps every five years just to make sure that it does kind of get reset, does get relooked at because things do change over time and there may be opportunities, especially as COVID and we look to work differently, we change things around, there may be further opportunities that we perhaps missed and I'd want to make sure that we don't miss anything and pick up every possible saving and reallocation we can. I would have thought once you put zero base budgeting in, it's quite easy to carry on doing zero base budgeting, isn't it? Um, if you were to do it purely and follow it kind of technically to the letter, you would strip it down to zero every single year, mm -hmm. which would be a lot of effort, I think. And then trying to build it up again when a lot's changed from one year to the next, but over five years, it might change significantly. So it's just trying to get that right balance between incremental and zero base budgeting. In theory, when we do it again in kind of four or five years time, as you say, it should be a lot simpler exercise because we've done it in the past. It's always good to have that check and balance periodically, I feel. Hmm. I just thought it strange. And the other thing, um, obviously, in your financial strategy, um, we now know that interest rates are um, particularly, um, dare one say, less than they were before. How how are you going to ensure that um, you're not overinflating what you think the interest is going to be on any balances that we hold? But again, I suppose this comes back to the zero based budgeting question, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, if I may, I'll bring as if in on that yeah, one. I saw his hand. Yeah, come up. it popped straight up. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <Come> on, Asif. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, and another really good question. Um, it's something that we have considered as part of our budget uh, setting process this financial year. As some of the members may be aware who are also present at ONA, we regularly present our Treasury management activities. And for the last few years, we've been achieving really good returns in the region of around 170 to 190k a year for the last five years, uh, five to six years. Obviously, with COVID now, everyone knows the base rate has reduced down to 0.1%. 
having spoken to our investment um, specialists as well, they've kind of come back to us and said, realistically, we're probably going to be achieving circa around 30k next financial year against what we previously used to receive. So what to kind of counter it, we've revised our budgets for next financial year and reduced our investment budgets down to 30k from 150k. I'm hoping that this will be short term, i.e. the next sort of couple of years, and we can then kind of build it back again. But it wouldn't be prudent to kind of disregard that. Um, I think it's safe to say next year isn't going to be about investment returns. It's going to be more about liquidity and cash flow and ensuring that we can pay our suppliers in a timely manner. So the focus won't be on returns more. So it will just be more on cash flow. I think that's a very good point. I think next year it's sort of sorting everything out again. Um, it might be something that you look at putting into the financial strategy saying that you know we will be paying perhaps quite quickly any of our bills mainly because it's the financial struggle for other people along the route and we'll all know that anyway thank you very much indeed thank you asif and thank you mark um thank you. there are no other questions could i ask mr Britton to put the uh, recommendations forward please Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the recommendation is on page 50, and it's that the financial strategy 2020 to 21, sorry, 2020-21 to 2024-25 is recommended to the fire authority for approval. And, uh, Chairman, the, uh, there are there are no indication that no indications that any member wishes to vote against or to abstain the recommendation. So the recommendation is carried. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Britton. We then go to agenda item eight um, on page 107. My goodness, lead members, Councillor Hopkins again. Um, is there anything you wish to say, um, Councillor Hopkins, before Mary Crothers takes over? Well, this is a more exciting soap opera than the Archers and the EastEnders combined. It <laughs> runs and runs. The, uh, the villains change, the actors change, but the story never comes to a conclusion. So let's hear where we are this Next exciting episode. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the latest update regarding the Emergency Services Mobile Communications Programme, and the last briefing was delivered I earlier this year. Um, members may recall that there have been many references to the full business case in the papers presented in the past, and the latest version of, of that case has been reviewed by the National Fire Chiefs Council Strategic Lead for Operational Communications and and the fire customer group and that's been on behalf of the fire services nationally a letter of response has been submitted to the program and this can be seen at appendix a of the paper and that's on page 113 of your packs um, this letter outlines the joint concerns of the fire sector four options have been um, presented within the business case the first two options have been largely dismissed within the document itself whilst the remaining two were based around an incremental delivery of the emergency services network since submitting this paper we have received notification that option 3b that had an airwave shutdown date of 2024 airwave being our existing system um, is no longer considered viable and the next iteration of the business case is likely to be based on option 3a which has an airwave shutdown date in 2025 so it looks like this this um, program is going to be rolling for a little while longer We've also learned that delivery of the prime product, this is our, our preferred product, and it will provide access to the full functionality of the emergency services network, has now been moved from April to October 2021. So as a result, the programme plan is now being re-baselined and this work will lead to a revised start date for the mass transition of emergency services. So we're looking at a, a further six months delay on that. On a regional note, and this isn't contained within your paper, this is for your information, members will recall that requirement for a regional programme manager within the South Central region has been fulfilled within um, through a contract with the company Mott MacDonald. This contract will come to an end in January and the decision has been taken by the three Thames Valley services that now make up the South Central region to use the grant funding to employ a full time programme manager to take on this role across the three services. So each service will still have a project manager, but we'll have a dedicated programme manager across the three services. A recruitment process has taken place and the successful candidate will take on the role early in the new year. 
Members can be assured that officers from this organisation continue to monitor the progress of the national programme and to engage with our colleagues at a regional national level to prepare for ESN. Um, this paper is just for noting. Um, do you have any questions? I think we look forward to the next episode of um, <laughs> <laughs> ESM CP because it, it doesn't seem to change, does it? It just seems to push longer into the longer grass further down the route. No, I think the reassuring thing, maybe at a lower level, is that we we now have a handheld device in, in the organisation. We're looking at carrying out coverage testing. So on a local kind of practical delivery level, things are starting to happen. It's just the, the, the higher um, strategic level and the operating mm. model and the, the funding is still, there's no clarity around that. No, no. Thank you very much indeed for your report. Mr Britton, will you read the recommendation, please? Um, certainly, Chairman. I'm just checking that, that no one wishes to ask a question. There's nobody's Nobody indicated to, to talk. Ask. OK, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the recommendation on, on page uh, 107 is for noting, and it's as follows. Uh, members are requested to, to note this report and Appendix A, the letter from the National Fire Chiefs Council dated the 20th of October 2020. Chairman, uh, no member has indicated a wish to vote against or abstain the recommendation. The recommendation is carried. Thank you. Um, we come to item nine, which is um, where we exclude members of the public. Um, I'd just like to um, make people aware that the date of our next meeting is Wednesday the 10th of February. And um, we do have um, on white paper the sale of the Great Home Fire Station. Um, the papers are there and we will go in to exempt when it comes to discussing any, um, any financial aspects. Mr Britton, would you like to explain the reasons why we're doing it like this, please? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, there is a recommendation to exclude the press and public, but um, the uh, agenda item 10 is a matter of public interest. So uh, uh, the, the authors of the report endeavoured to put as much into the public domain as possible in terms of the proposal for sale. Um, but I think it's inevitable that um, to have a proper discussion uh, to whether to support the recommendation that the financial aspects will need to be discussed and it's important uh, to uh, preserve the, the commercial advantage that the authority might have uh, when it goes out to, to tender. Thank you. Thank you. Um, shall I, I'll put the recommendation now, Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, the recommendation is that the public and press be excluded from the meeting by virtue of paragraph one of part one of schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972 as the reports and appendices and minutes contain information relating to individuals and also paragraph three of part one of schedule 12a of the local government act 1972 as the report and appendices and minutes contain information relating to the financial or business affairs of a person including the authority and on these grounds it is considered at this moment in time that the need to keep the information exempt outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information um, Chairman, that's uh, that's a proposal. I'll, I'll wait to see if any member wishes to vote against or abstain. It doesn't appear to be anybody abstaining or voting against. No, Chairman. I think uh, I think the motion is carried. Is carried. Um, so we're we're for the benefit of viewers of the webcast, um, we're about to go into a private session for the reasons explained. Um, if you just pause for a moment while I get confirmation from. Um, ICT that the webcast has, has finished. Just bear with me one moment. Thank you.